essentially this, this is what's called the in basket. So this is where various messages and information is going to come back to the clinicians. This is a particularly gruesome one in that this is a test thing where we've tried, we've tried every kind of result or every kind of scheme we can come up. So this particular doctor, actually this is a nurse I'm logged in, has a lot of things to check. But it's not going to be that bad. But if they had sent a message, it would come here under the pa patient message request. Um, and you'd have a list of these messages that uh, you could see. Here's one I set, sent when I was setting up, saying hello to all the participants at the CF Education Day. And so essentially it's just a fancy email box. And if they're, they can do work from this, they can forward it to the physician, they can forward it to somebody else that needs to you know, follow up on something. Um, they can open up and do a note, do clinical documentation. Um, oh, that's not the one I wanted to do. If they wanted to send a message back to the patient, pick a patient message. And again, kind of just really just a fancy email. Um, has a lot of cool functionality though. You can, you can determine that uh, I'm, I'm sending you some information and if you don't read it or respond to me, you know, let me know. So I can say if I don't hear from you by Friday, I'm going to call you up. So you can say notify me if the message doesn't get read. Um, you can say don't send this till next week till I know something else or if you want to send questionnaires. Um, as I mentioned, there will be pools of people handling this volume. That's, that's the way Kaiser does it. That's the way Palo Alto Medical Foundation has it. But if you get into one-on-one -on -one and you just want them to come back directly to you, you can make that choice. Here's where you can you know, add a questionnaire. We've been going out and meeting with, with all kinds of clinics. Um, we've built about 40 or 50 of these from intake questionnaires to specific sleep questionnaires. Um, So it saves you a little time when you get to clinic. You don't have to do all that in the paperwork. You can send it back. Your team can review it first, see if there's things that are missing. They can reconcile it with the medical record. They can update. Um, pretty fancy stuff. Um, and, and most of the clinics have really liked it and really sort of given us a real run for our money trying to build these, <laughs> uh, which has been the fun part. So they could send that out, they could set it to send out every couple of weeks if it was a follow-up, if it was a specific symptom or behavior that they were following up. They could send that at any kind of interval that they wanted. Another kind of nifty feature, um, and I'm going through this because it might you know, instill some ideas in anybody here, is a thing called Track My Health, where in this case, you can build sort of symptom-specific, um, basically entry, flow, they're called flow sheets, where simple one would be keeping track of your fever, monitor your glucose, keep track of your blood pressure over time. So essentially, at home, you could do one of these actions. In this case, if you were taking your own blood pressure, um, enter it and send it back to the hospital, essentially. So if I wanted to do a new one, I'm going to do it today. And let's say I'm feeling good. There it is. I'm going to submit it. Boom. So that's going to become part of this graph. You have your own, your own ability to kind of look at your blood pressure. I guess, I guess I ate one of those salt sandwiches this day, Mary. <laughs> My blood pressure went bananas. <laughs> um, but mostly I'm getting a handle on it. And this would go to your providers. They can do the same graphing, the same tracking, that sort of thing. I don't have anything fully built here, but I'm sure you'll like this. You'll be able to pay your bill online. So if you have those horrendous co-pays for that horrendous medication costs, I almost had a stroke when I heard that. <laughs> um, you'll be able to do this online, and it's going it, to. You'll be able to do hospital and, and inpatient billing. Um, 
you can guess what I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to build this complicated stuff. And you also can uh, per per personalize this. You can change your colors. Woo you can also tell us how you want to be notified. We can send uh, ticklers to you when you have, when you have uh, new results. So if you have a new lab result, we can send you know, non-specific, no, no health information in there, message to your regular email, to your Gmail account that says you might want to check your MyChart account, you have something in there. Um, and you'll be able to sort of control your own access and, and uh, password and that sort of thing. Any questions so far? Because I'm about to get into some slippery territory here in a minute. <laughs> so, um, this, is, this will be pertinent to all you guys. So, so this is what's called teen access. So what we've set up here is, is what a parent can view of a child's medical record. And essentially, in this case, we're defining a child up through age 11, just under 12. Once you get to age 12, lots of laws change. Not, as we all know, lots of things that change at age 12, but the laws change a lot too in terms of what can be both released online and what what people can see online and what parents can see and what, ch what now teenagers can do and what kind of services they can give consent to. So most people, most, most institutions that have built my chart or my health have not bothered to create any teen access classes we call. So it's how teens and the parents of teens can view the medical record. Most institutions just cut off the patient portal at age 12. They don't even want us. They don't want to even wade into this. Um, we are wading into this, <laughs> um, partially because we have a lot of adolescent patients. We have a big adolescent medicine program, and we want to get on the front end of things. So we actually are going to build. The the term is proxy. So a proxy is a parent or a guardian who has a proxy relationship to look at their child's uh, record. So in child proxy, where Zoe is eight years old. The parents can see any, virtually anything. Once they become teens, yeah, we have to take some of that way, away. And, and it's driven by both, again, legal things, because there are things that teens can consent to services for on their own, and they have the right to that privacy. So uh, reproductive health, uh, substance stuff, mental health, behavioral stuff like that. They can, they can actually get services on their own. and. You're not allowed to see it. Um, and then there are other things that are just common sense. It's just, you just don't want to wade into that. Um, so online, we do reduce the amount of things that both uh, the parents and the teens can see. You still have full rights as a parent to do whatever you need to do and go to medical records and ask for records so it, it doesn't freeze you out, but it's, there's some online tricks to this. Um, so if you kind of look here for a minute, you can sort of see in this column, you know, what, seven or eight, ten items. With a teenager, you're just going to lose some of those things. You're still going to be able to see test results, current health issues, allergies, immunizations, some history stuff. But you're going to lose the ability to see some of that stuff. You're also not going to be able to, this is, this is the counterintuitive part, and I think this is the part you're not, maybe not going to like that much. You're not going to be able to see appointments anymore. Um, because an appointment could be, if, if a teen made their own appointment in teen clinic um, for, for a you know, a, uh, STD test, um, that's confidential to them. So, a po Mary? We have filtered out certain kinds of tests, so we can do that. We can filter out certain kinds of tests and medications from view, um, but we can't, there's other things just to, for technology reasons we can't take out. But something like appointments, which you think are really benign, we actually have to take out. And we actually had to take out medications because we can't... Medications are really tricky because a medication for a, a sensitive service in one situation is a, you know, a common treatment for another disease. Um, but you still can send, both, both the teen and the parents can still send messages to their team. So the reality is you can do a lot of stuff. And you can still request an appointment. Unfortunately, you just can't see everything. <laughs> but um, I, I really believe that the ability to send confidential messages back and forth sort of alleviates some of those, some of those things. So it's just kind of an important thing to know 
that when, when they hit that magic teen thing, um, some of the things are going to go away. Um, and just in terms of online view, we'll still allow you to pay your, no, just kidding. <laughs> um, you'll still have a fairly robust set, set of services. Um, and we even have, and this is going just a step too far, if parents and child really disagree, you know what, we can still give the, like the, the teen says, I really don't want this to happen. The parents will still be able to have an even more limited view where they can still at least get allergies and immunizations, still do send messages um, and get service oriented stuff. Um, so we really want to make this you know, we have a plan to really make it an inclusive conversation point where folks are deciding. Go. Can I ask you a question? So, what if the team wants their parent to see certain appointments, like all their culinary appointments? Yeah, we can't do that. It's really a, so it's really a drag. <laughs> um, I, I will say, so, um, in the family advisory group, I was looking, uh, you know, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with them. Um, this may sound like I'm weaseling just a little bit, but I mean, right now, we're, we're, just, we're just trying to make this work. And we're starting, like I say, most people don't do this teen access stuff. All the feedback I've gotten from the families is, do you know how horrendous that is to have these medically complex kids and all of a sudden at age 12 just <coughs> drop off the cliff? So we're, that's next. <laughs> Once we build this and make sure it can work, we're going to take on this, these classifications of medically complex kids. Um, there is a fairly, uh, most people do this if kids are truly disabled, meaning really not capable of making their own decisions and stuff like that. That's a little easier thing. You can sort of make a legal definition of that and you can build around that. Because we're also working with the law here. <laughs> so we're, we're, we, we, are, we really want to figure out how to do these medically complex, because it might, might might not just be pulmonary, it's the kid who's got pulmonary and ENT and this and that and the other things. Um, it's and tricky. There's no, tri um, exception either for a man to man Yes. There is? Yes. Well, we haven't built that yet. That'll also be part of what we call optimization. Um, but there will be a, a, a case where teens, whether they're emancipation is a little different. They could actually get full adult access because I haven't addressed that. But I mean, people. OB moms can sign up and have full access to their own accounts. I've sort of not gone into that here, but we're going to take on teen-only accounts, either for eman well, emancipated or, uh, there's another term that's slipping my mind right now, but they're basically living on their own, our teen health fan and all that. We didn't choose that battle for our first go-live stuff. Mary. They can sign up for their full account, yeah, adult. Nope. Well, unless they want to give it to them. You could have adult to adult proxy, so it could, you could set up your parents to see it. I mean, married couples often give proxy to their stuff to take care of their appointments and stuff like that. So there is adult to adult proxy as well. How'd I do? Any, any more questions? I think I covered the things I wanted to cover. All right. Oh, sure. No, the teens will have the same. The teens will have the same access to the parents. One of the basic principles: um, you you don't want to create an imbalance where somebody can see more than the other. Um, I'm sure it doesn't apply to anyone here, but I, I I worked in psych for a long time. If you gave the child more access, you create a situation where the parents might say, "You give me your password." You know, you can get into really forceful, difficult situations. Um, so our whole principle is they both can see the same thing, so there's no imbalance and no, no reason for anybody to push anybody any further than they're already going to have as teens. How will the teens get access to their sensitive results then? They, won't, it, they will be when we build this teen-only class. <laughs> um, you can do that. But in this case, we can't do it. So they would have to call? Yes. It doesn't solve everything. But when we do the sensitive or when they sign up completely on their own, they will be able to see the services that they have consented to, but they won't be able to see everything else. 
because you have this mixed consent with parents and teens. Okay? Let me just do one last thing. You may not want to hear any more about this, but if you do, there's my email and phone number and all that kind of stuff. And, and um, we're really into this. And Dr. Onishir Avani, who couldn't make it today, he's an adolescent medicine doctor, he's published across the country, he's a great guy. We're really into this and we're really into solving these problems. Um, and I'll talk to anybody about this stuff at any time. Thanks so much. Let me hook you. Okay, and to continue pressing on, um, it's a real pleasure to introduce Christine. She doesn't need an introduction, but I'm introducing her talk. She's going to review for us uh, why we make such a big deal about uh, airway clearances, particularly with the different tools and treatments and modalities that we have around. Christian, you really help us make sense of why we make such a deal. I think you have to share the screen, right? Oh boy. Connect, 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 connect. If you know how to do it, go for it. It's a little different than mine. Yeah, this one. First of all. Oh, she's got it up. Perfect. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. What a great pleasure to speak for you guys today, and I hope that uh, we can um, talk about airway clearance and why it's so important to us and to you and to your children. Okay. What do I just, what do I do? Okay, here's an important slide. We are a team. It's all about us working together with families and patients to make sure that we are checking our, our children for new symptoms and working with the CF healthcare team to make sure that we have a plan of action in place to make sure that we can keep children as healthy as possible. That's the goal. We're all here for the same reason. So there's three major causes of lung problems. And Dr. Donaldson this morning really gave a good introduction to what airway clearance, the need for airway clearance, because he showed you all of these things and we're just gonna go over them and what we can do to um, counteract them. Obstruction is when the airways become blocked with thick, sticky mucus. And we know now that CF creates stick, sticky, thick mucus. So that's a big problem. Inflammation is when the airways become irritated and swollen. And then infection is when germs or pathogens like bacteria and viruses grow and injure the airways. So what ends up happening is kind of a vicious cycle of inflammation, mucus plugging, more mucus, bacteria building up, more inflammation, and it goes in a circle and creates quite a problem of lung damage. And this is happening all the time. This isn't just when you have noticed it, your child is sick. This is happening every day in the life of CF patients. It's an ongoing phenomenon. So I have this cartoon because I wanted to show you 
what a CF airway looks like compared to what a normal airway looks like. So I want to show you that in the normal airway, this is where the air would be going and the mucus works its way out along these <coughs> path passages. But when you have a CF airway, you end up having a lot of thick mucus that does not move very well. And anyone knows that if you look at this airway, it kind of looks like how a sore would be on your body. There's a lot of the same things happening. There's bacteria, there's infection, there's inflammation, and then sometimes even bleeding can occur because the airway can be so inflamed and angry that it can start bleeding. So these are the things that are happening inside a CF airway. So I put this slide up here because Dr. Donaldson was talking this morning about how the airway is in CF and I wanted to show you with a cartoon that in a normal airway you have this nice cilia here that can beat and move this mucus out like you saw in that video where the mucus moves out very quickly. But when you have a CF airway, you have all of these, and this is kind of more like a cross section. Instead of being nice and clear in there, you have all sorts of stuff like cell debris, mucus, um, bacteria, and other things that really don't belong there. And as if the mu thick mucus isn't a big enough problem, now you have all these other things in there creating even more of a difficult environment to clear. So the cilia end up getting smooshed down and they can't work effectively. And that's kind of demonstrated here where you see that they're all kind of laying down, trapped by that mucus. So you have a lot of mucus and what's worse is it's very difficult to get it out because you don't have the regular mechanisms working to help push it out along the airways. So what do we do to, to treat and prevent lung damage? Well, these things I hope are going to look familiar to you. We have bronchodilators and what those do is actually open up the airway so that there's a bigger cross section. Mucomist is something that makes mucus thinner by breaking up the actual mucus bonds. Uh, hypertonic saline actually works its way into that space where the cilia are and helps to create more of a liquid barrier there so that the cilia can hopefully work a little more effectively. Pomazyme actually works on those little um, dead particles in the mucus to break those up and they all work together to help to make the mucus thinner so that it can actually get out. Antibiotics are made to work on the mucus that's left behind after your airway clearance because it's still in there, it's still infected and it keeps coming, it doesn't go away. So the common airway clearance techniques that we use are chest physiotherapy, which is kind of a gold standard of doing percussion on the chest to help move secretions along. And something we like to use a lot in our center is the vest because we find that it doesn't take a lot of effort or patient cooperation to use. It tends to be very effective no matter how you do it. But I will show you there are some ways that it doesn't work very well. And then these other types of airway clearance are all very effective for removing secretions if they're done properly and they're done correctly. So if you're interested in any of these things, and we're going to talk a little more about some of them today, I want you to contact me and let me know so I can help you learn. So when is a good time to do airway clearance? Well, it's good to do it after your breathing treatment because you've put those medications in there to help get your lungs your airways open, help get the mucus thinner, help make the cilia work better, help break up those parts in the mucus, and now you need to do the airway clearance to actually try and clear the mucus out of the lungs. It's always a better idea to do airway clearance when you haven't eaten because when you have eaten and you're trying to cough and remove mucus, you're much more likely to get um, nauseated or to have problems with that. So, so that's not a a solid rule, but that is probably a good idea. Now, when you do your airway clearance, because the mucus is continually build, building up, you need to do it on a kind of a regular basis. If you were to do your treatments uh, like at 8 in the morning and then again at 10 in the morning, 
you would be going, you do two treatments in the day, but you would be going a very long period where the mucus is building up until you do another treatment the next morning at eight. So it's much better to make a plan where you have a treatment in the morning, hopefully before school, so you can get the mucus out of the lungs so that you're feeling at your best when you leave the house or before work or whatever it is that, that is coming up. And then in the evening again before bed so you can clear that mucus out before you lay down and it builds up again. So hopefully these time, this timing makes sense. That's how we came up with it. There's times when you might need to increase your airway clearance, and I don't think that it always has to be when you've called your CF center and they said, yes, you need to do three treatments a day now. There's times which really make sense. When you notice that your child is having increased coughing, that's a good time to do more airway clearance. It certainly isn't gonna hurt anything. All it is gonna do is get more of the mucus out. So if they have a lot of coughing and it's dry coughing, that's one thing, and I'm sure increased airway help clearance would help, but if they're having increased mucus, that's another good reason to do more airway clearance. Or if you notice that the mucus is changing color and it seems to be uh, getting thicker or looking different than before. So I put this picture in here because I wanted to show a picture of a not so good way to do airway clearance. So the things that I want you to notice is that I, I understand that when you put a vest on a child and it starts jiggling that it's easy for the child to fall asleep because it's kind of like riding in the car. This child has fallen asleep and not only is he sleeping laying down, but he also has a nebulizer going which won't work very well in that position and the mask is on his forehead. <laughs> so <laughs> I found this on the internet and I know this happens. And I want to tell you that doing no airway clearance is very bad. Doing, doing airway clearance like this is better than nothing. But I want to show you the ways to do airway clearance so it's the most effective. This is another great example. And I want to point out that this isn't a hospital because the person giving the treatment is wearing gloves. It's a hospital bed. It's a little sick girl that's sound asleep, laying down, and the, and the mask isn't very close to her face, but in addition, there's a nasal cannula blocking her nose and there's a pacifier in her mouth. So where do you think the nebulizer medication's going? I don't think it's really going in the lungs, but it's a good try. <laughs> so patients, parents are the best advocates for their children. <laughs> If you find that they're doing things in the hospital that you know are not correct, please speak up. It's just like seeing someone come into the room and they're not doing good hand hygiene. Parents have to take an active role in trying to protect their kids. And, um, you know, us caregivers, we're only humans. We make a lot of mistakes, so we need help, too. Well, it's also important to realize that that's why hospital treatment is the way it is. And parents often ask us not to wait their kid up during the treatment. Spread the word. Yeah. Um, here's another example of something that I have done a lot in the hospital. I used to blow treatments by patients' mouths because if you put a mask on their face, they'd get upset. And I didn't want them to get upset. It's very ineffective. Um, sometimes that's all you can do because you just screaming while you're taking a nebulizer is not very effective either. But there are a lot of uh, really great videos and resources that I happen to have in the clinic if you need them that can help you learn how to give a, a breathing treatment to a child and get them so used to it that they can accept the mask and do a good job with it. What do you think about this picture? She's too old. Thank you. <laughs> We're trying to get our children independent and transition